Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, I think that would be much more entertaining than my, my talk, so my apology. Uh, to start with, let's go back 10, 12 years from now. Uh, I'll be showing my age here, so pardon me for that. Uh, but imagine that you are in a dev conference or a vendor conference or at any tech conference and you are a developer or ops. Of course, they didn't show up in the same conference, but imagine that that's the situation. And then you heard somebody on the stage talking about 10 deploys per day. Or then you heard, you heard about some companies doing 50,000 deployments per day. And you were thinking, and I'll give you some uh, classifications of those thoughts. Number one, that's BS. That, that's first impression. The second impression is, uh, well, that only works for companies that post cat pictures on the internet. And the third is, well, that's insane, and that's, uh, I think those companies, developers, they hate ops, and that's why they did that, 10 deploys per day. But there are a few of us that thought that, hmm, that's interesting, maybe we should do that too. So I'll take you quickly through my journey, through that experience from that thought that, this sounds good, this sounds interesting, let's do that, to being more pragmatic than that. So, welcome to my talk. Just before I start, this is uh, about me. I go by Topo, uh, currently a Vice President at Architecture, Enterprise Architecture Organizations in, in Fidelity Investment. But over the past, I spent a lot of time in IT, various IT organizations, starting from retail, healthcare, and financial companies. Uh, at a core, I am a developer. I coded in Java a whole lot. And then I used to actually look at code and find bugs in other people's bugs, not mine, very quickly. So they put me on support so that I can fix stuff on the go. I had many, many situations where I stopped uh, on the highway and, and on, the call, on, the call, on the phone fixing stuff. Uh, and then I started actually fixing code and started breaking things, so they promoted me. Uh, and then through that chain, I became uh, enterprise architecture, uh, uh, enterprise architect. I joined Capital One uh, around 2010, and uh, I started working on uh, uh, what you call the real-time messaging platform as an architect or SOA architect. I don't know if anybody remembers SOA anymore, service-oriented architecture. But those are the days, again, I'm showing my age. Uh, so uh, anyway, I got into DevOps because of that feeling that I had in conferences. I thought that that's pretty cool, that you can actually deploy 10 times a day. Uh, before joining IT, I was in, in, in I had a PhD in semiconductor physics. Uh, I did some research in nanomaterials after that, but uh, it's a whole together a different, different story how I landed in IT. Before I start, I want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me. I think this is a great honor. Uh, really, really appreciate that. I know I can see the faces. I know many of you here. Uh, I know you are far better speakers than me, uh, but I'm here just to uh, express my, my, my uh, 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 opinions, some opinions, some sarcasms, uh, and some of uh, my own learning. So some bragging time. I brag about these two things uh, in, in IT life. One is a Hygieia DevOps dashboard that uh, I, I created while I was uh, at Cattle One. Uh, it was open sourced in 2015 and also got some awards and many uh, uh, large enterprises still use that. Second thing is Investment Unlimited, uh, which is kind of outcome of some research and some papers that we did, and I was one of the co-authors, nine, co nine authors, one of the nine co-authors, co rather. So those are my uh, bragging things. Before I start, I wanted to uh, just lay out a few disclaimers. This talk does not contain anything related to my current employer fidelity investments. That's number one. Number two, uh, through some of the stories that I will tell or uh, some of my opinions, you may hear some product names or tool names, uh, but those are not any kind of endorsement or recommendation of any vendor, product, or service. 
Uh, and then there's an unwritten disclaimer here. If you hear any stories, uh, if any companies or any situation or any anecdotes, those are all made up. Just assume that they may or may not have happened ever. So with that, uh, I'm at a DevOps conference, DevOps Days DC, and I cannot not start without this picture. So this is the typical picture of DevOps, as you all know. Uh, there's QA engineers, there are developers, there are product managers, there's Scrum Master, and all that. And it went on for a while until people figured out we lost somebody in this whole equation because they're all looking at the DevOps things in, in their own, pers uh, own perspective. So that's the security guy that came in later, and they called it DevSecOps, which basically means don't leave us out, we are part of it. And they started examining things a little from a distance to see what's going on. Uh, they actually were interested in making things better, so it became DevSecOps, but I still call DevOps just to have the whole breadth of various things in between Dev and Ops. And for me, I'm not a good uh, speaker, so I just use the shortest version of anything, uh, so DevOps is good for me. Uh, and that's the security guy. But while this was going on, it was all fun. It's all about tools and culture changes and sharing things and breaking down silos between dev, ops, security, QE engineers, and all that. There was a group of people who were not in this mix at all. They were actually watching from far away with a telescope. And this group of, is that Dave? Oops, I don't know who generated that. <laughs> So they thought that this is Dave Oops. They, this group of people are actually your risk, compliance, audit, those group of people that were watching all this from, uh, fun from a, from a distance and waiting to see what, what happens after that. Uh, I'll tell you a story. While I was uh, at, at Capital One, again, these are, this may or may not happen. May ha happened. These are just uh, my made up stories. Uh, so uh, I was actually working with a team, and they were doing good uh, product development, and they wanted to actually de uh, deploy to production in a fully automated fashion without anybody's manual touch. And when the risk audit people came to know about it, they scheduled a meeting with me, and they said, tell me what you are trying to do exactly. And I said, what, what exactly I heard in those conferences, 10 deploys per day. I said, I want to deploy this product to production 10 times a day. And they said, that's not happening. Um, like, what's your problem? And they said, well, we have rules and policies. And I'm like, I never heard of those before. And I said, uh, uh, what policies can you show me that will tell me not to deploy to production? Well, these are all documented, right? I'm like, I have never seen those documentation. And then I said, okay, verbally, can you tell me? And I was meeting with the audit uh, VP, vice president of audit. Uh, and again, these are all made up stories. Uh, <laughs> just to be clear. Uh, and I said, okay, besides those documents, can you name me some requirements that you have in your head? And the person said that we have no requirements. And I fell from my chair. So the essence of this story is that the person was telling me there was no requirements that they can uh, point me to, yet they want me to follow certain policies and rules and regulations before I deploy to production. And that blew my mind. And I thought that there is a whole world of things that are completely unknown to developers or operations or any product development people that they don't know about. It's completely blank. And the auditors and risk and compliance people there on another island, they completely don't know what's going on in the development world just like this. They're just watching from a distance and waiting for things to fail or waiting for things that, that they can catch. So that was my story that started. And I realized that from developer's perspective, engineering product development perspective, we want a shiny car and we want to drive it very, very fast. However, we also don't realize sometimes that we do not want one of these or that 
or even some, some stuff falling on our head. And the last thing we want is these people chasing us around. And these are the regulatory bodies, the policies, the compliance people, and all that. Other things are accidents that always happened in IT. Now, I hear this, security audit compliance are most frictional. And I hear this from all the developers saying that, hey, we want to do this, but security guys are stopping us, the compliance people are stopping us, the risk people are stopping us, what can we do? The thing that I realized is that compliance versus governance, these are two different things. And again, these are all my learning. I'm not an expert in risk policy, governance, GRC, or anything. These are just my learning from developer's perspective. And that's what I'm trying to present here. What I learned is compliance is about checking the box. You have certain rules. Did you test? Check the box, yes. Did I scan? Check the box. Did I review, code review, check the box. However, governance is actually active management of risk. And this was kind of light bulb uh, for me. When I realized that all we are looking for is a good governance in our software delivery life cycle, then it all, all made sense for the time being. So this is the thing. It's all about risk management. There are certain risks that we can hone on to and say that these are real risk, and the things that we need to figure out is how to mitigate those risks. And again, if we use this language, then what becomes easy is that the, the, the people who were sitting with the telescope and watching the whole DevOps drama, they now have a way to communicate to us and we have a way to communicate with them. In essence, bring those two parties together just like we did in DevSecOps. We brought the security people in our domain, and then we brought the other people in our domain. We call this DevStarOps, DevSecOps, DexKios, whatever that is. And this is the time when we needed to get the security comp or the audit compliance disk people in the mix. Now, the thing that I realized is, as, as engineers, we need to do is identify the risks. What are the risks at every step that you take in your software delivery lifecycle, starting from creating your story to creating your code to check in your code or commit your code or do a pull request to do the security scanning or unit test or whatever the thing that you need to do? What are the risks in each of those steps? And then for each step, you need to then find out how do you mitigate that risk. The way you mitigate the risk are creating the controls. The controls are nothing but requirements on a standard that you would create to define the standards of your software delivery lifecycle. So think about the risk and then the, 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 the controls that you need to create to mitigate those risks, put it on a standard, that's your standard against a very high level policy statement that the company may have. And then all you need to do is implement and test the control. Now, as I said, to do this, you need all these different parties in a room, so to speak, and talk about how to identify the risks, whether the, the risks are real or, or imaginary, and then for each real risk, design the controls, and then implement and test the controls. This is a group activity. Sometimes it is called threat modeling, but I'm not getting there in terms of threat modeling, but this is kind of threat modeling of your software delivery lifecycle. And the threats could be downloading unapproved software or vulnerable software or libraries from Maven Central or PyPy or whatever that may be, or by mistake, deleting some unit test cases so that your bad code can go through or it could be some other people actually uploading the same test coverage report every time the software goes through production. So these are all risks that you can uh, uh, design controls for. Now, why do we need control? This is one uh, uh, quote that I always remember. Uncontrolled variation is the enemy of quality. So essentially, if it is not controlled, if the risks are not mitigated, you are actually producing bad quality code. And as developers, as engineers, we all agree to this statement.
that if we have uncontrolled software delivery lifecycle, potentially we are producing bad quality code, and sometimes we may not even know it until it breaks in production. So the other side of this is the, 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 the shiny things that happen in DevOps uh, world or the regular developers that I used to be some time ago, a long time ago, actually. Uh, these are the questions that pop up in uh, regular engineers' mind. Why do we need controls? Well, we said that. We should trust the developer. Of course we trust the developers because we hired them, right? But we should trust but verify at the same time. Hey, all these controls are blocking my team's innovation. Well, bad quality innovation is not a good innovation. Let me solve business problems instead. Or we use fully automated pipelines. So, yes, if you use fully automated pipeline, then inject those controls in the fully automated pipelines, right? So these are some of the thoughts that the DevOps engineers may have, but we can always guard them by saying, hey, these are the reasons why you need controls for. So as I said, it's all about risk management. Now, I looked at, studied all the risks that can happen through your software delivery lifecycle and came up with three broad categories. One is we need two sets of eyes. It's essentially saying no single developer can change something and send that code to production without anybody else's knowledge. And I think that's a, that's a very practical thing that, you know, I could produce bug without my knowing. I need a peer review on my code. Or you are writing test cases, somebody else needs to look at the test cases. Or you are doing some security scan, somebody should verify that actually that bug that the scan uh, result uh, uh, talked about is really a bug. Least privilege. And this is about not everybody should have access to all the system. I'm talking about admin access. That makes sense. The other thing is only approved changes are set to go to production. That also makes sense. So if you look at and study the whole software delivery lifecycle and kind of design your controls or, or write down your risks and the mitigation process, I think you can classify them into these three broad categories. One is always have a second set of eyes on anything that you are doing. Least privilege, I should not have broad access to everything that I can have. And then only unapproved, only, only approved changes are, are going to production. Now, all these three, three things, or the controls or, or, or requirements, are not anything new that came with DevOps. They have always been there. And these are classic SDLC controls. Two sets of eyes. We implemented that before all this automation and DevOps in terms of segregation of deities. And I think many of us still use that as a control. What it means is that if you are a developer, then you cannot deploy the code. Well, that's a frictional point right there, which essentially says that if I have a team and I have a team of developers and when they develop the code, we need somebody else outside of that development team to actually deploy the code. That basically says that we are going to rely upon a person who have no knowledge about the code that is being developed and trust that person to deploy the code to production. And the other thing is that where do you find those people? Typically, they are in your ops organization or production support organization. Their job is to actually just deploy the code and, you know, among other things. But I know that in many large enterprises, there is a specific group of people still there. Their job is to deploy code. Now, it may sound funny because if you notice, those people cannot do anything else because if they start developing code, they cannot deploy anymore. Now, they do de uh, de uh, develop a lot of scripts, and nobody pays attention to them. So this whole paradigm that two sets of eyes can only be implemented via segregation of duties is fundamentally wrong. And besides, where can you hire those people who can only deploy code? Because once they get trained in doing other things, they cannot deploy code, because now they, are be they will be delivering code or developing code. So you need actually to hire button pushers. I don't know where you can just find button pushers. Their job is to just deploy the code and not develop anything. Besides, if you are deploying code, chances are that you have full access to the production box, which by itself is very, very dangerous in my mind. Least privilege, lock down everything for developers. As I said, that is one of the classic controls. If you have a developer, if you are a developer, all you have access to is the dev 
uh, environment where you can actually put some code and nobody cares about that. Only approve changes. The classic control is change approval board. Who all have change approval board still going on here? A lot of people. Uh, they are still there across many, many organizations. And the reason is uh, that there's not enough trust that the whole lifecycle process is well managed in terms of risk management. If we can prove that they are well managed in terms of risk, then I think some of these change approval board may find other better things to do other than sitting in a room and just going through a checkbox, which is essentially the compliance and not actually governing the quality of the software. Modern is DLC controls. The same things, two sets of eyes, can be now objectively managed. Number one, everything has source code. We all agree to that as DevOps engineer. Our source code, the actual application code, whether it's an API or batch process or whatever that may be, should be in a source control system. Infrastructure should be in a source control system, infrastructure code. Test code should be in your source control. Any script or any pipeline or any process that you may have should be in source control. And then every change is peer reviewed. That is the good replacement of the typical control called segregation of duties. The second is least privilege. No one should have persistent right access to production. Nobody. Nobody in the company should have persistent right access to production. How do you get code to production? Fully automated or human-triggered production change. Only the pipeline as a system can have access to production. And then if somebody needs access to production, which we always do time to time, uh, depending upon how bad the incident is or how bad the bug is, only break glass to access production. Now, a lot of DevOps-enabled uh, teams actually have good, solid, persistent right access to all the environments, if you notice. And it is dangerous because anything can go wrong, not intentionally, but mostly unintentionally. I may think that I'm in QA environment, but I'm actually in the production environment on the same two terminal windows. While in, you know, having after a few coffees, I may get confused as to which in window is what. And I have done that in the past, and uh, the, you know, many of us have done that in the past. So that is dangerous, and that's why I always go for no one should have persistent right access to production. And the challenge to the DevOps team is, if you are a good DevOps team or DevOps-enabled team, you should have fully automated pipelines going to production. Only approve changes. Now, these are the things that will vary from enterprise to enterprise. You may define 20 such requirements, starting from security test or scan, complete functional or regression or performance test, user acceptance test, monitoring, you should have monitoring. So these are kind of open-ended, so depending upon what product you're delivering, what product you're building, how you're building it, what technology stack you have, what kind of business you are in. If you're just posting ad pictures on the internet, none of this may apply to you. But if you're a financial organization or government or very uh, uh, critical uh, functioning organization, you may have a list of 100 things. But all these things can objectively be implemented based on the data that is produced by your pipeline and other tools. Modern days tools, they all have the ability to spit out data, or you can pull the data from all these different tools and actually create a full attestation of things that are happening from your pipeline, from, in your pipeline. All these things that I've said uh, are kind of documented in these two uh, documents. One is the first one on the left, DevOps automated governance uh, reference architecture. This documents everything that I said. Uh, this is a paper published by uh, IT Revolution in 2019. I was one of the co-authors. And then Investment Unlimited, that's the book version of that technical paper. Now, you may ask, why did the book uh, uh, need to be there besides the paper? Well, as I said, if you go back to the picture where the, the audit compliance people were at the far uh, location watching the DevOps fund, you'll notice that 
the, the implication of that is that there's a group of people in every enterprise, they don't go and talk to uh, the developers on a day-to-day -day basis, and vice versa. How many of you know your auditor in your organization? Do you know, have you talked to them recently? Did you say hi? Did you ask what's going on? How can I help? Well, I never used to do that until I learned to do that because that's the only way to get people together. So there's a cultural element to all this. Besides the technical paper, there's a whole lot of stuff that you need to do culturally to get these people together on the, on, on the same table, on the same room, on the same building. So this book is actually talking about uh, how to do that in the means of a story, a uh, fictitious story that uh, uh, talks about a bank going through this uh, transformation. Now, having said all this, uh, I just want to hone in on these two things, DevSecOps and Shift Left. DevSecOps was created with a good, good idea. Essentially, what people used to do is, I used to do, develop my code, and then I was told to ship that code in a zip file and email to the security group. And they would take that code, and I had to open the ticket also. They would take that score, code and do whatever they wanted to do with that code and send me a report in a, in a Word document. These are all the things that you need to fix before you uh, go to production. Well, I spent all my dev cycle development uh, time uh, on developing the code. Now you are asking me to fix all these 50 things. I have no idea how to do that in a, in a matter of days. So that created a friction, and that's why the term DevSecOps was created. Can we introduce those things that, that security wanted to do right from the beginning when I'm developing the code incrementally or as a part of the development life cycle? Can I do my security testing and scanning and report out as I am developing, as I'm in the code? And that brought out a term called shift left. The shift left was actually meant that let's shift left the processes that security or many other people wanted to do on the right side of the pipeline or the software delivery lifecycle and shift them left to the beginning so that we all can do this together on an incremental basis in small batches. It did not mean that it's time to train all the developers how to write security, secure code. It's, it did not mean it, 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 the meaning was not to uh, implement this new set of practices in a typical developer's head. Because a developer is a developer, they are not, in most cases, be good, secure developer. That's not their mindset. You need to help the developers while they're developing code and teach them on a continuous basis. After some days, yes, I can tell a SQL injection right from the get-go in the code, but not from the beginning. So, the other thing I want to talk about, shift left, is not block left. This is I'm seeing in, in, in the industry now. Now that we have tools to actually scan and report on things, hey, can we block the things? Well, that's dangerous because many of these security bugs are contextual and false positives. You do not want to disrupt development lifecycle just because there's an uncontextual things discovered through your scanning system, or even unit test coverage. If you say that my goal is to have everybody follow 80% core coverage, other, otherwise I'll block, that's a frictional statement right there. Because what if I'm just having a 78% code coverage? Are you going to block me? I know it is 78%, but give me one more day, I'll get it to 80%, but let the other people go through the whole process. But anyway, I'm seeing this block left business coming along, and it is very, very frictional. I think I saw some lightning talk uh, in, in the, in the uh, today, I think it is. Uh, one of my previous colleagues is doing that. You should, you should listen to her talk. She's very good. So instead of blocking left and misusing the term shift left, I think we should be thinking about how to actually streamline the process. I'll give you an example. I was, again, these are all made up stories, right? Uh, I was uh, with a cybersecurity guy, and we are debating about this blocking left and shifting left business. His point was we should block if we find something bad right there and block the pipeline. And we debated, and then we decided to come uh, uh, on a Zoom call 
for half an hour and talk about that. The Zoom call started, and every time the, that person opened his mouth, I interrupted him. And I kept doing it, kept doing it, and that person got really, really mad. And he said, Thopo, can you just let me speak? I said, that's exactly what developer's feeling is when you actually block from their, or, or block their pipeline. So with that, I will uh, uh, leave it at that. And thank you very much. If you have further questions, please uh, reach out to me. I'm available. Thank you so much.